Genesis 37, verses 1 to 4 and 12 to 28. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bela and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring back word to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his, brother, uh, conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. This reading comes from Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. Jesus walks on the water. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, Command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. 
So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I invite you to think with me of a time when you've been afraid. There are many kinds of fear, many things that we might be afraid of. And many of our fears have to do with our physical safety and well-being. But I've been afraid in other ways too. I was afraid when my eldest son Christopher was diagnosed with leukaemia. I was afraid when I knew my marriage was ending and I wondered if I would ever find happiness again. I was afraid when I finally made the decision to come out as gay. I was frightened when I found myself between pastoral calls. I was afraid when I just could not shake the terrifying black dog of depression. Fear, fear causes us to wonder, to ask questions, questions projected into an unknown future, a future that can seem even more frightening than the scary present we find ourselves in. Today's gospel passage is all about fear and about our responses to fear, both ours and God's. And we picked up our gospel story this, mo this morning exactly where we left off last week. Last week was that long day on which Jesus had learned all about the death of John, his cousin. And he had tried to find some time to be alone to pray. But he was thwarted by the huge and needy crowds. Remember in that story how even despite that need to be alone, he healed them. He took compassion on them and he fed them along with the disciples. On that day of fear and anxiety, Jesus found it in himself to feed God's hurting and hungry people. We come to today's story that follows immediately on afterwards. Jesus told his disciples to get into the boat. Actually, he made them get in the boat. It's an odd detail. Go, he tells them. Go out there and sail on that lake. And finally, finally Jesus finds the hours he needs to be alone. Time to pray, to grieve, and to process the, the horrifying and at the same time incredible events of the day that had been. Matthew, in writing this gospel, sees Jesus as the new Moses. So many of the most important events of Jesus' life occur taking place on a mountain, like Moses on Sinai. Jesus goes up to the mountain to pray and commune with God. And Jesus is on the mountain as the disciples go out in the boat. And time passes. Now the Sea of Galilee is known for its unpredictable weather, a little bit like the uh, Lake Alexandrina that can start off nice and still and calm, but in the afternoon winds come up and before you know it, the waves come crashing in over your boat. These massive storms on the Sea of Galilee can blow up all of a sudden, even on relatively mild and cloudless days. And so the disciples are caught off guard, if you like, by just such a storm. There they are in their boat, battered by the waves and far from land. They can't make it back into shore. And it goes on all night long. It's a long, long night. No rescue in sight. 
the wind and the waves threatening to overtake them. No captain to shout words of reassurance. I wonder what they were wondering. What was going on in their minds as they faced those fears? Is this the end for us? What will become of us? What are we to do? Every gospel, every passage of scripture emerges from a particular historical situation. And Matthew has just described for us the situation of the early church. Jesus, whom Matthew has called Emmanuel, a Hebrew word for God is with us, Jesus is suddenly, distressingly absent. He's not there. He's not in the boat with the disciples in the storm. And the church is likened to a boat. It's in the midst of a journey far out at sea, far from land, battered by the waves and storms. Actually, the Greek word here is not battered, but tortured. The church is being tortured by the storms all around it. Matthew is telling us how the church is suffering in those early years. That time when Jesus' followers are beginning to go forth to spread the good news. They are in the boat, the church, their only fragile craft preserving from all the threats around them. They are facing persecution and struggles and difficulties and times when they really wonder where Jesus is. It's a long, long night. No rescue in sight. No captain to shout words of reassurance. Except, except in the latest, darkest part of the night, literally the fourth watch, between somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. There he is. There comes Jesus, walking on the water. One of the hardest things we can try to do is to shift our minds into the mindset of the early church to understand how they heard this story. These are people who never placed a phone call. People who never had to think about which brand of toothpaste they will buy. People who never had to wait for the results of a scan. That world might seem pretty hard for us to grasp. We who have all of our knowledge that we have and all of our scientific discoveries right at our fingertips, we know all about gravity and why precisely Jesus should not be able to walk on water. But when the early church, those telephoneless people, heard this story, they heard it quite differently. Ah, they said, he walks on water, which means he conquers it. He walks on the stormy sea, the chaos. He is the conqueror of chaos. He is the conqueror of fear. Even when he is not present, he is somehow present. And when he is present, God is present. God who conquers chaos once and for all. They understood the sea as being that chaotic being of which they were all fearful. It could take your life like that. But here was Jesus walking on that chaos, calming their fears, bringing peace in the midst of the storm, not protecting them from it. So many people seem to think that the Christian life means that everything will go fine and you won't have any problems. Well, that's just, put in your own word, it's not true. But Jesus does meet us in the midst of those times. So back to the boat. Fear is gripping the disciples and they're wondering what's going on. Jesus comes to meet them and even then they don't recognise him. They're fearful. It's a ghost. It can't be him. Quite revealing words, really. Jesus hears their terrified, terrified cries and says, Take heart. I am here. Do not be afraid. 
There in the midst of their fears and struggles and worries, in the storms that are battering them and threatening to take their lives, Jesus comes and meets them, even in their fear of him as he does, and says, Take heart, it is I, be at peace. That must have been powerfully confronting, at the same time powerfully comforting. Encouraging for the disciples, battered as they were by the storms. Battered as they were as the disciples of people wondering what their future was going to be. But Peter reacts differently. Peter, Rocky as he's known, the rock of the church, the one who's both leader and representative of all of Jesus' followers, sees Jesus walking on the water. He becomes agitated, I would say. He seems to want and need something more. Lord, if it is you, command me to come out there on the water with you. Peter needs proof. And in a sense, he puts himself right out there. Make me do something special. Set me apart and then I'll believe. Peter's putting the burden of proof on Jesus. It's sort of like the desert story. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But then as Peter begins to sink, he cries out, Lord, save me. No question who Jesus was at that point. In other words, Peter is us. No matter how you look at him, faithful and at the same time faithless, ego-driven, and yet humble, doubting and believing, all rolled into one, just like all of us. In fact, that word that Jesus uses when he says, why do you doubt, literally means divided in two. Why are you divided in two, ambivalent? Why are you of two minds? Peter is us, doubting and believing, trying and fearing, all at the same time. And yet, at the heart of his plea, isn't he also saying somehow, draw me, Lord, draw me to you. For me, when we're afraid and we're wondering what the future holds, our greatest hope is to be in the boat, part of the community of believers where Jesus' presence is made known. When we're afraid, it's in the presence of the other, the face of God shining through those around us, our friends and our loved ones, even through the face of strangers that can make the fears bearable. It's in those times that those fears are not taken away, but they become somehow bearable because we share them with another. When we walk together, when we call each other back into the boat, when we reach out that hand, just like Jesus, and call each other back, or when another does it to us, meets us in the midst of all that chaos and calls us back. Even when we are wondering, is this it? Will this be the end for us? The gospel message insists it is not the end. Get in the boat. Stay connected to the body of believers. Row out across the lake. Put your heart and soul and mind and strength into your service of God and God's people. Trust and be not afraid. Friends, there will always be storms. There always are storms. But God is with us. And we are called to keep our focus on God instead of focusing on the storm. No matter what we might be facing, no matter where we might find ourselves this day or where we might find ourselves in the future, this story reminds us again and again that we are not alone. Just like each time we gather around the Lord's table, we are reminded again and again, we are not alone, that God is with us. 
that we will experience new life even in the midst of difficulties. That we will experience hope in the midst of despair. That we will find a fresh and new beginning even when we think that all is at an end. Wherever you might be this day, I simply pray that you might find that peace that you seek. Amen.